when uh, we started in the early 80s, we, we were trying to purify the virus by uh, a sucrose gradient. Retrovirus particles are purified using a laboratory procedure developed over 40 years ago known as density gradient centrifugation. The cell culture that is undertaken by the scientist to produce workable quantities of virus results in a liquid suspension made up of cells, macroscopic and microscopic cellular debris, virus particles, if any are present, and culture fluids. This suspension is spun in a low-speed centrifuge which creates a sediment consisting of the cells and heavier solid material and, above the sediment, a liquid supernatant containing the much lighter microscopic material. If retroviral particles are present, this is where they will be distributed. Next, a small portion of the supernatant is removed and very gently placed on top of a solution of sucrose. This sucrose solution is prepared in a special way such that its density increases gradually from the top to the bottom of the tube. In this diagram, the layers of different densities are shown as discrete bands, but in the real world of the laboratory, these layers gradually merge into one another. Purification by this technique relies on the fact that particulate matter in the supernatant sample will gradually sink down through the sucrose solution until it reaches a place in the gradient where the sucrose solution and the particulate matter have the same density. When an object gets to this portion of the gradient, it cannot go any further. It is exactly like trying to force a tennis ball to stay put at the bottom of a bucket of water. As soon as you let it go, it bounces back up to where it wants to float according to its density in water. This means that in the sucrose density gradient, all objects of the same density will eventually congregate at the same place in the gradient. In the case of retrovirus particles, this is where the density of the sucrose reaches 1.16 grams per mil. Because the particulate matter in the culture supernatant is so light and tiny, the passage of the sample through the gradient has to be speeded up by spinning the tube in another kind of centrifuge known as an centrifuge. This machine rotates the tube at speeds between 40 to 60,000 revolutions per minute and produces a force many thousands of times gravity. In this diagram we have assumed the supernatant sample contains retrovirus particles and you can see them gradually moving through the gradient and being arrested at the 1.16 grams per mil density. Here is a short demonstration to illustrate how a sucrose density gradient solution can be used to separate objects of different densities, in this case beans and macadamia nuts. In this simplified version we will use a two band density gradient consisting of water with a density of 1 gram per mil and sucrose at a density of approximately 1.5 grams per mil. First we prepare our sucrose solution by dissolving sucrose, ordinary table sugar, in water. Then we make our two density layer solution by carefully pouring our lower density layer, the water, on top of the denser sucrose layer. Next we place our sample on the top of the two layer solution. Since these objects are so much larger and heavier than virus particles, gravity is more than sufficient to propel them through the gradient. In fact, as you can see, in this experiment the separation is virtually instant. There is no need to spin the glass in a centrifuge. The result is one density band consisting of nothing but beans and another density band consisting of nothing but macadamias. In other words, these objects have been successfully purified. What may not be obvious is the part your eyes play in this experiment. Without looking at the two density bands, which is equivalent to performing the electron microscopy, you will not be able to tell if any objects are present, what is their morphology, and whether or not they are pure. Well, what's the purpose of the purification then? Well, to, uh, to make sure uh, uh, you have uh, a real virus, uh, you know, uh, so Montaigne claimed to, to prove that he had a, a particles, he had proteins which are not present in any other vi retrovirus, he purified the virus. But he did not publish any electron micrographs of the purified material to prove, you know, you see in his believing. And uh, they claimed that they had purified material, but there were no electron micrographs. 
And it, it is, this is one of the conditions where Baresi Nussi and Jean-Claude Charmaine put it in 90, 1973. You must have picture of the purified virus and show that the material contains nothing else but particles with the same physical characteristics. But no such pictures were published. Is it important to photograph where the virus is banned in the gradient? Yeah, <clears throat> because retrovirology has also some, some history. These are established techniques. If you go to C-type particles, they can be easily bended and they are stable. And if you think HIV is another a new retrovirus, you have to go the same way, just to, to be acknowledged as, as a retrovirologist dealing with that new virus in a proper way. Hans Gelderblum, he said it's important to photograph the density gradient where virus is banned. Why is that an important step? Because uh, this is, I mean, electron microscopy, for example, it's always very important to see the morphology of the virus particle. Uh, it's in the region of the density gradient, okay, where you think you have a virus purified, and I will say in good shape. If you check after by electron microscopy, the electron microscopy will tell you, okay, you have the right structure of the virus particle with all the envelope which is uh, uh, on the surface of the membrane. Okay. Because very often when you make purification, um, you uh, alter all this process, making uh, sucrose gradients and centrifugation. It's a uh, it forces, you know, on the virus, pressure on the viruses, and it does not like it too much, mm -hmm. especially for HIV, where the envelope uh, protein, which are anchored on, uh, on the membrane, are not uh, covalently anchored. So that means that uh, very easily you can lose the envelope protein. Now the GP120? So it's important to check then on the uh, electron microscope whether the structure of your virus is the one that you are looking for. With all its viral protein, the envelope protein, structural protein, everything, you have the right shape, the right structure. And it also shows you what isn't there, correct? Exactly, also. So you're saying Montigny never proved the existence of a new retrovirus because he didn't photograph in the test tube? Mm, or, as I said, he says it is essential to purify the virus to prove that there are, uh, the, the, it has proteins which are not present in any other virus. That's the only way to prove that you have a new virus. But he did not publish pictures. So since he did not publish pictures, we don't know what he had in his purified virus. May have, it is possible that he had purified virus, but it's possible that he did not have anything there. And that's what we've been asking from the very beginning. Why there were no pictures, which are essential to, to, to prove purification. When purifying, Gelda Bloom told me it's important to photograph the density gradient where virus is banned. Why is that a crucial step? Well, Gather Blum, I know him well. He's a good electron microscopist in, in Berlin. And actually, um, he gave me the best picture of my virus. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, of course, in order to, to purify, you have to make this uh, sucrose gradient density uh, an equilibrium uh, to have a sharp band. And if you take that sharp band, you have uh, almost uh, pure. Not completely pure, because there are cell, uh, cell vesicles which have the same density. This is why you don't see uh, in the picture, you have a mixture of uh, uh, cell uh, vesicles, cellular vesicles and viral particles. So is it, is it really important or is it not really important? For us, it's not important. But uh, some people say, if you don't have complete purification, how do you know the disease is caused, it's not caused by something else? 
to silence them, how come you guys didn't just show pictures from the gradient instead of just the culture? We, we, we first show it from the culture. Mm -hmm. by, just by centrifugation, you know, but not sequence gradient, just by making a pellet of the virus, you could uh, look at it also this way. But you, uh, here, of course, you have many impurities you know, coming from the cell. The sucrose gradient has the advantage to partly purify the virus, but again, even in the band of the virus, you have also cellular vesicles, which have the same density, but not the same look, of course, at the electron microscope. And you're saying that in the purified banding area, there can be other contaminants, and that's why pictures are essential? They, yes, in the purified, the, the method they used, you can get, by this method, you can get material which, has, which is not viral, but it has proteins, it's cellular fragments. You know, the cellular fragments can, with this method he's using, could be at the same place. And then you can have there only cellular fragments, or you can have a mixture of cellular fragments and, and viruses. But it's important, it's extremely, it's, it's crucial to have a picture. If you separate by density, 1.15 gram per ml. You have a lot of vesicular stuff inside. Mm -hmm. Not related to virus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Detritus, a reaction product of the cell. You have a lot of host cell constituents in that band. That's not too nice. So are there other particles that can look like retroviruses in that in that band? Yes. In that material you can have cellular fragments and they have proteins and they have RNA which retroviruses have and in fact they may even look like retrovirus particles. So it is important to have, it is crucial to have an electron micrograph of the material for, for us for example, and for many, any other scientists to believe what they are claiming. When you purify HIV, there are some challenges because the contam it's contaminated with cellular debris. But I said. And particles that look like retroviruses but are not infected. Yes, as I said. How do you distinguish between what is infective and what isn't? You cannot. Montagnier gives a very, himself gives a very, gives crucial importance to this band because he said if the particles do not bend at the 1.16 gram per mil band then they are not retrovirus particles. Mm -hmm.